so I know that he does better than what's on the page, if that's possible. It's just time for us to come around again and do what he loves best, which is continuing the saga. George Lucas's Star Wars, the biggest movie of all time, blasts back onto British screens this month with a new installment, Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. Well, we finished the cut. We're doing the sound effects. Uh, I'm going over to London on Monday to do the music with Johnny Williams. Uh, we should be finished around the middle of April. Uh, special effects-wise, uh, we're uh, about or 400 shots away from being finished. They're on schedule. Everything seems to be going really well. You know, I feel, I feel pretty good about it. George always wanted to make nine. He wanted to make the first three, then he wanted to make the prequels to that, then he wanted to make the last three. And that was something that was part of his concept. Whether George only completes six of the nine-part series or he actually ever really ultimately uh, completes the nine, it's really nine parts of one film. It's one big saga, a saga about a family that happens to live in a galaxy far, far away. Afraid, are you? No, sir. See through you. We can. Be mindful of your feelings. Your thoughts dwell on your mother. The Phantom Menace is the first chapter in the story of Anakin Skywalker, the slave boy who will one day become Darth Vader. What does that got to do with anything? This one deals basically with the issues of evil and the issues of how a good person turns bad. It's a tragedy. Set 32 years before the original Star Wars trilogy, the film begins when the mysterious and evil Darth Sidious incites the hostile Trade Federation to threaten the peaceful planet of Naboo. I'll deal with that. Two Jedi Knights travel to the planet to rescue the young Queen Amidala. I'm ambassador to the Supreme Chancellor. I'm taking these people to Coruscant. I'm trying to remember the play the character called Qui Gon Jinn. Kind of a maverick Jedi who sometimes goes against the wishes and the dictate of the Jedi Council, and he has a um, an apprentice with him called a Padawan, who is this young Obi Wan Kenobi, played by Ewan McGregor. And along the way, a young slave boy, Anakin Skywalker helps him out, and um, so they bring him along, they win him out of slavery, or he wins himself out of slavery. The four of them and Jar Jar make this journey together. Moisture farms, for the most part, 
some indigenous tribes and scavengers. The heroes find themselves on the desert planet of Tatooine, filmed around the Bourbon architecture of the Sahara Desert. David West Reynolds, a top-selling Star Wars writer and modern Indiana Jones, travels North Africa on a pilgrimage to uncover the lost cities of Star Wars. When George Lucas made the first Star Wars movie, he used Tunisia as a real-world setting to ground his fantasy adventure. The desert landscapes and traditional architecture provided the perfect location for Tatooine, Luke Skywalker's home planet. In episode one, the story returns to Tatooine, and George Lucas returned to Tunisia. Anakin, drop! Scattered across the Sahara are ruins. Out in the sands, abandoned in the middle of nowhere, like this. But this one's different. In fact, the entire place is built as a film set. It's Mos Espa, the home city of Anakin Skywalker. It all imitates Tunisian architecture with a few technological additions. Are you sure about this? From Tazur to Perth, Star Wars echoed the dreams of many a small boy. I haven't quite got the grip for my lightsaber yet. This is all the, all the lines. It was me and my mates used to watch it, and uh, we'd, we'd be able to do the whole thing, we'd take different parts. I like being Princess Leia the best. Do your hair? Well, I have long enough at the time. I can probably get away with it now. Originally, I wanted to do a, kind of a Saturday morning serial space adventure and started working on a script and um, discovered when I finished it, it was like 180 pages and it just couldn't be made. It was just way too big, too much stuff going on. The next draft, I took it and I cut two thirds of it off and just dealt with the first act. And I said, what I'll do is I'll break it into three movies and I'll put the other two movies on the shelf, which are the second and third act. And I'll just make the first act, I'll make that into a movie. So from that point on, I just started writing that screenplay. And that screenplay turned into Star Wars. Like fellow San Franciscan filmmakers, Francis Coppola and Saul Zantz, Lucas has not always found it easy to realize his vision. You know, I remember coming, having lunch with George at the Palm Restaurant in New York, and he was very depressed because he had just come back and they wouldn't sell him Flash Gordon. That's right. Yeah, and, I remember that. And he that. says, well, I'll just invent my own. What a, what a limitation had you gotten Flash Gordon, I wonder. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't give it, give it to me, because... You finished the script, and remember you gave it to me. Yeah. I thought it was terrific, and then you totally changed it. And I kept saying, well, why are you changing it? You know, what was it that, how, how did that script differ? I know that you added the two robots at the beginning. Yeah. But what was it that the, the script I read, how did that differ other than that opening? Was that the main difference? Well, no, there was a lot of, there was a lot of character differences. I mean, I had the other, I had the, I had Luke and Leia sort of both in it. And um, there were a lot of, the, the Jedi actually, I mean, Darth Vader, the father, was actually there. He was the father. And oh, really, he was. A, he a, was their father, and and he was a Jedi, and they were both there, and it was like, it ended up, you know, I just, it didn't seem to play as well as I wanted it to play, right. and um, so I did. I sat down, actually, and did a whole new treatment. I mean, a whole new outline. Yeah, you had a and, whole script, and, and uh, read, did it all over. It all over again. Lucas was also influenced by the samurai films of Japanese director Akira Kurosawa. I've said that there's been a lot of Kurosawa influences because I greatly admired Kurosawa, especially the film Hidden Fortress, which told a story from the point of view of two serfs, two slaves, peasants, who tag along with this famous general and a princess and, you know, royalty. And the whole story is told from their point of view. And I like that idea. I like the idea from telling a story from the lowest person's point of view uh, in the food chain. 
And uh, that's how R2, how the story got to be told by R2 and 3PO. Don't get technical with me. What mission? What are you talking about? I've just about had enough of you. Go that way. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted scrap pile. And don't let me catch you following me, begging for help, because you won't get it. The droids R2-D2 and C-3PO are the only characters to feature in all the Star Wars films. My agent said there was this uh, man, this American, making a cheap, low-budget science fiction movie where the, all the money was going on the sets and the costumes, special effects, whatever. And he wanted to see me, along with hundreds of other people in England, where it was going to be shot, for the part of... And she paused, she paused. A robot. <laughs> I said no. She was, she was really shocked. What do you mean, no? You know? Anyway, she made me go. I got a phone call from someone who said, that, would you be interested in a science fiction movie? And I said, yeah, what? And they said, well, you'd be running around in a hairy suit with a mask on. And I said, what? So, what else has changed? Um, so, I... I went up and saw George Lucas and Gary Gertz. This is 1976. Saw the, had the interview 20 minutes later. I got the part. It can't help you. Chewbacca is just fantastic. And Han Solo is just the coolest character in any film I've ever been with. They're such best friends, him and Han Solo. And it's quite appealing, that friendship. And he's quite tough and mean. Chewie just came naturally. I don't know how and I don't know why. But I could go down on the set with a costume on, or with a three-quarter costume. Talk, be talking to someone, having a cup of coffee or whatever. I'd say, right, put the heads on, Chewie will come alive. Go out, do it, come back, take the head off, I will be back to me. There's not a great deal of soul-searching going on when you're playing, or, you know, this kind of character. It's, it's fighting a kind of Jedi frown, which I wish I mastered that. Quite a lot of that. Eyebrows. George, I'm doing the Charlie Sheen shot, whether you like it or not. Okay, but you come up, you should sort of look off this way, yeah. and then you turn around and you see all these ships landing behind you. Okay. Well, you're directing, after all. I mean. It is not the greatest platform to project the most extraordinary performance. You're there to do a job that's very specific. It's about creating a character that's instantly understandable and serves the story completely. Some of the lines are absolutely impossible to say. But uh, not too bad. I got off fairly lightly. I mean, Alec Guinness has got some cracking lines in this film. I don't know how he does them at all. Uh, but he, he gets away with it. Are you all right? What's wrong? I felt a great disturbance in the force, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror suddenly silenced. I feel something terrible has happened. You better get on with your exercises. There's so much more to think about just than, you know, how am I going to say my line? What am I thinking right now? You have to think, wait a minute, I have to hit this mark and I have to stay out of the way of the space behind me because that's supposed to be some character and, you know, the blue screen's over there and the spaceship's over there and you've got to make eye contact with that you know, person over there who's not standing there. And it's it's just a lot more difficult than an average film because there's a lot more to think about. <laughs> there's a line I remember from the original test, which is not in the film, where Han Solo says, hey, look, I've held up my side of the bargain and I'm turning this ship around. I said, but we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquili or Sullis, and what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. And I thought, who talks like this? Well, I did say to George, you can type this shit, but you can't say it. And, uh, and, and it's, still, it's still true. I mean, it, it, there's a bit of a trick to say it'll take a few minutes for the Navi computer to calculate the coordinates. I was doing it sort of flippant, because I couldn't see any other way to say this dialogue. And he took me aside, George. I think this was the longest chat we had at that juncture. And he said, she's really serious. You know, this is 
her planet that's in jeopardy, and she really doesn't like this. I mean, so I got it. Yeah, this was this was serious stuff. George's style of filmmaking was difficult. He never said anything. He never asked me to do a scene a particular way. He'd just say, action, cut. Terrific. Well, actually, he sometimes said terrific. Often he said nothing. He didn't want to sit down and talk about the characters for hours and end. If at all, in fact. Quite happy not to talk to you at all. Thanks, an actor. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot better. But we do joke about, with him about that, because he's not very... He claims, he's, he says he knows exactly what he wants, but he just has got no idea to ask that. So he's just got no idea how to tell you what it is he wants, which makes for a lot of fun on set. But Lucas has developed other methods for improving the performances of his actors. If you spin around and look like this, because what he's done is he's jumped up and right. come over you. If I have two people playing in the scene, they're in a two-shot, and one guy's great, and the other, one guy was great in take three, the other guy was great in take seven, and if... I can get them to sync up in their performance and cut it so that I can take the pieces right, then I can put them both in the same shot and have them both have a perfect performance. This is you. That's me there. I recognize the, the hunched shoulders immediately. <laughs> it's pretty much the same mix of cast in terms of uh, awareness. Uh, I've tried to cast uh, actors that aren't instantly recognizable you know, it'll be like that you know that some people will be vaguely aware of Liam but most 12 year old boys won't right here. they'll never seen him before difficulties with his British crew and the special effects had made the experience of making the original Star Wars too stressful for Lucas and so he looked to other directors for the sequels The Empire Strikes Back and The Return of the Jedi The Phantom Menace is the first film he has directed since 1977. Let me ask you a question. Were you seriously thinking of not directing uh, Star Wars? Which, this one? When we were all saying, oh, George, you got to direct it yourself, and, oh, I don't know. No. Well, I was always going to come back. Well, I, how come you was... put us all through that? We all... Because I'd like to torture you guys. <laughs> <laughs> here, so here. you were always going to direct it. Well, I didn't know whether I was always going to direct it. I mean, it really depends on where I was. And I wanted to come back and direct. I didn't, you know, I... I you mean, we're talking about the this one, one coming out. For a long time, he was saying he yeah. didn't know that he was going to direct it. All of his friends were saying, oh, you got to direct it. You must do it yourself. Blah, blah, I got blah. a lot of attention. He gave a lot said, of attention. Do it. Yeah. Said, oh, please. Finally, yeah. You weren't going to get any. <laughs> oh, who was going to direct it? Uh, I never, I, I never really considered anybody else to direct it. Ah, now it comes out. Creating the exploding spaceships and lightsaber duels that would wow audiences was immensely difficult. In 1975, the special effects industry had all but died in Hollywood, and Lucas had to set up his own company, Industrial Light and Magic, not only to create the visual spectacle, but also to build the tools to do the job. The skill and the... Uh, capacity that was developed to generate the special effects was beyond anything that anyone had seen up to that time. And the effects used in a way that had never been attempted before. Real storytelling with effects. It was just matter-of-fact stuff. Um, when you think of Luke Skywalker first getting into that little hovercraft thing, you know, and just... It was, it was like getting into a car, driving to the next set of traffic lights, you know? There was that wonderful throwaway quality of this fantastic kind of other world. Great, everyone wants to do that, don't they? Every, everyone wants to hurtle along floating off the ground like that. There's some really nasty skeletons coming up as well. You've seen the burnt skeletons of those parents. Go on! They're graphic, isn't it? Tour buses and fans now search up the obscure locations that inspired the look of Star Wars. This is Ajim. It's a sponge fishing town. But 20 years ago, this was Moss Eisley. Luke Skywalker's land speeder cruises right through here, past these ruins, behind me to that building, which was the cantina where they hire Han Solo, their pilot. Now, in 1976, you've got a false entrance built out there. There's a dewback tethered off to the side. A few drunk Jawas sacked out in front of that doorway. But this was the place. 
everything in Star Wars is based on something here on Earth. It's a, it's a root of a design or an idea or a culture or an um, artifact that exists already. Uh, we have changed it, twisted it, moved it, shown it in a different light, if you just uh, put it with a different background, taken it out of its context, done everything we could to make it unusual. But it has a very familiar and strong ethnic base. George spelled out some very specific time periods that we should look at. One was going back to the 20s and 30s for sort of the uh, Art Nouveau movement and the Art Deco movement. Um, the other one was to go back to African art, which hasn't really been explored that well in film. Check it out, Corporal. We'll cover you. Roger, roger. Normally, when you think of science fiction, you try to project ahead and you try to think, oh, you know, 2050 or whatever, and you try to come up with some really far out designs. And that's where the danger lies. Instead, George went back in history to design the future. This is the Qasar of Mednin, a traditional Berber design of a type seen throughout southern Tunisia. Created as grain silos, each of these individual units, or gorfas, is a storage chamber. The extraordinary aesthetic of the Berber Qasar offered an exotic and yet recognizably humble setting for the slave quarters, which are home to young Anakin Skywalker. It's in this street that Anakin bids goodbye to his mother as he leaves with the Jedi Knight, Qui-Gon Jinn. Welcome to the episode one art department. This is where it all starts in terms of design. On this wall, you can see um, this is sort of George's first opportunity to see a lot of his written words implemented into a design. And what we try here is to try to, you know, come up with something that George likes. And you can see here, this is one of the early sketches for the attack tank. <laughs> One of the next stages is to actually implement them and combine them into a production painting. And in here, you can see this is the finished version of the attack tank. And the main purpose of the production paintings is to try to capture the, the mood and the drama of, the, uh, of that moment. And hopefully, by picking out the key moments, it will be enough to convey to the crew what the film is all about. Um, one of the other problems that we do that, that we try to solve is once the designs are finished is we normally try to build them as sort of hard surface maquettes or as sculpted maquettes. It's, Wonderful because once we get to this stage, George can look at it, see if it's working for him or not, and then if not, we go back and refine it and then build another maquette. Uh, another stage that we do is once we get the designs drawn and approved, is we do um, storyboards, which are these here. And this is again really helpful because it starts to put in sequential order the drama and the, and the flow of the film. Um, finally, once all the designs are kind of approved, George likes it. What I try to do then is to build some full-size cardboard cutouts. And these are over here. And what these are helpful for is it, it tells us very quickly if something is working or not, cinematically. Um, this will tell George if the droid is tall enough and if it's menacing enough or if it's too small and not menacing enough. Because these films are, are again, so complex in terms of their special effects, um, what we wanted to do was not just have traditional storyboards. We wanted to have moving, real animatics. We actually wanted to have the film done before we actually started shooting. He would sketch out a scene. Then we'd have storyboard artists draw it up. And then we'd give it to our animatic designers. And they would actually turn it into little pieces of film. Then we would take a look at it. He'd rewrite the scene, then give us three or four more shots to do. And then slowly, layer by layer, we would create this storyboard that was moving. You were able to see the scene before you shot it and see yourself as a kind of a computerized stick figure where you had to walk and where the camera angles would be. And, and I found that a great help, you know. You hear that? Yeah. That is the sound of a thousand terrible things heading this way. If they find us, they will crush us, grind us into tiny pieces and blast us into oblivion. Ah. Your support is well seen. This way, hurry! 
One of the first problems that um, we had to solve in tackling all the designs for episode one was the main character of Jar Jar. And it was a hard problem because Jar Jar needed to carry a lot of the film. And, and George stressed that, you know, you have to like this character. And this is where um, part of the problem of creating digital character comes in, in that we have the danger if we execute it too well that it looks like a guy in a costume. Creatures are an integral part of the Star Wars universe. And I wanted to have creatures that weren't people in suits that could act. I've always wanted that. And so I've been pushing the technology to be able to achieve that. So Jar Jar was sitting there waiting to happen as soon as I could, you know, we got to Jurassic Park. And I said, aha, now we're on our way. Now I can do this. Hey, Jar Jar, keep away from those energy binders. If your hand gets caught in the beam, it's going to go numb for hours. Jar Jar is the first fully animated digital character in a live action movie. The actor Ahmed Best provides Jar Jar's voice and also stood in for him on set. You're thinking, you said people are gonna die? I don't know. Gungans get pasted too, eh? I hope not. By shooting two or three takes uh, with Ahmed there and shooting another two or three takes without him there, I could take the best take, whether he was in there or not in there, and I could take the best take of the other actors where they have the best performance, and then I could just erase Ahmed if I needed to, or he might not be in the shot at all anyway, and then I don't have to erase him. But now I can just erase him. I mean, the technology is such that I can just get rid of him. Hold it back and go! In spite of modern technology, more primitive techniques were used to get the right reactions from the actors as they traveled at light speed. I was amazed at how doing the battle sequences in a spaceship, I imagined they'd be all hydraulic and we'd be thrown around. And, but in actual fact, there's just someone in front of a light going like that, flagging the light off, and someone going, blast, and we'd pretend to be hit. I was so disappointed. <laughs> It was surprising to see all the backgrounds painted in so so realistically and so elaborately. It was really, really cool to see that because for us, we shot with a blue screen the whole time, which gives you the impression that it's not going to be too exciting. And then you see these amazing things and you see yourself in a place that you've never been, which is really bizarre. It was really cool, though. It is a great gift to see you alive, Your Majesty. How many uh, screens are you opening? We're only going to open on maybe 3,500, maybe 4,000 at the most. Only 3,500. What do you mean only? I thought it yeah. used to be 2,000 was a big deal. Godzilla was like in 7,000 screens. Yeah. You know, that's like the big number now. And everybody expected us to go out on 10,000 screens. I mean, everybody said, you're going on 10,000 screens, aren't you? I said, no. I said, we, don't, we want to be in quality theaters. We want to have a quality presentation. I want people to see this in, a good, in good conditions. I'm not interested in in um, you know, just throwing it out there and getting all these records in the first week. It's not over yet. It is for me, sister. Look, I ain't in this for your revolution, and I'm not in it for you, princess. I expect to be well paid. I'm in it for the money. You needn't worry about your reward. If money is all that you love, then that's what you'll receive. Lucas is now able to control which you cinemas get to show his movie. Really Back in 1977, the story was somewhat different. I care. Releasing the film was was uh, a problem. The, the the film opened in some forty theaters. Um, now, that has to be seen in the context that a very big major release in the late 1970s would be 600 to 800 screens in the United States. The truth is, we couldn't book it anymore. The exhibitors didn't want it. They didn't understand it. They were worried about the same things: war in the title, will people understand it, there's no stars, why will people come to see it? It, it wasn't in a lot of theaters, but every theater, the, like the 9.30 a.m. shows were sold out to a seat. You couldn't get into any of the 9.30 a.m. shows. You know, that's good when that happens. That, that's, that's a good signal. And George was euphoric when he got that news. Yeah, all Scott. Yes, I bet you have. The success of the film was due to more than just its groundbreaking effects. Star Wars was different from other films of its ilk. And it became very popular, I think, because of the same reasons that kids love westerns. 
The Western has to do with good and evil, very clearly defined. It has to do with the outdoors, with wide open space. You're not restricted by walls of a city. You're out there. The Western was the last mythological format that had been developed in this country. You know, and it pretty much died by the 60s. So I wanted to try to see if I could resurrect that. Sand people, worse. Come on, let's go have a look. Well, come on. Well, there are two banthas down there, but I don't see any. Wait a second. They're sand people, all right? I can see one of them now. On these cliffs at Sidi Bu Halal are the remains of a Berber city that's now reduced to nothing more than rocks and broken pottery. But this location also served as a site for a number of scenes in the first Star Wars film. The canyon represents the wilderness, a classic gateway to the mythic hero's journey that Luke's own adventure will mirror. He must survive an encounter with the guardians of the gates, the Tusken Raiders, before he can continue on his quest. <laughs> They're set in the future, but they've got a feeling that they're in the past. And they're very uh, solidly based in kind of legends or fairy tales with the prince, with the characters are very... You've got the young, naive prince, the beautiful princess, the jester, if you like, with Han Solo and the wizard with Obi-Wan Kenobi. You've kind of got the bad, good and evil. And, and it's, it's kind of... Uh, it's fairy tales. It's become a kind of modern fairy tale, really. I request the boy be tested, Master. Oh, trained as a Jedi, you request for him, hmm? Finding him was the will of the Force. I have no doubt of that. Some people have told me that it's kind of a religion. And that was interesting to me, because it... You see all the religious aspects in it when you watch the films. Ultimate it's not any direct universe. sort of preaching, but you do kind of see where it has mythical and religious implications. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the Force. You know, the idea that there's a Force guiding us and that there's a destiny and a fate. And, and I think that's really what appeals to people, because it's, it's something that, that gives them a sort of um, meaning and hope, I guess. Star Wars owes much to the works of Joseph Campbell, a writer who drew together folk stories from across the world, identifying a common theme, which he called the hero's journey. This follows a young man, forced away from his homeland and sent on a mission which is both important and enlightening. On the way, he encounters wizards, princesses, and monsters, before descending into a labyrinth to secure a final victory. I was going along in my own story. I was trying to, you know, write whatever I felt. And then I would go back, once I've written a script, I would go back and sort of check it against the classic models of the hero's journey and that sort of thing to see if I had gone off the deep end. And simply by following my own inspiration, the thing that intrigued me the most is that it was very close to the model. This is the town of Matmata. It was here that the interiors of Luke Skywalker's home were filmed. In this hotel, the city driss. The door here leads only down because the entire hotel is underground. Lou, Te Uncle, if he gets a translator, be sure it speaks Bachi. Doesn't look like we have much of a choice, but I'll remind him. It was in this very alcove that Luke Skywalker sat 23 years ago having a frustrated conversation with his Uncle Owen over dinner. Parts of the set are still here, the edging on this door frame, the painting overhead, haven't changed at all. Domestic scenes, like the one around the dining room table, oh, yeah. ground up. Star Wars in the rituals of everyday life, in contrast to the film's heroics and space battles. Luke's journey begins here. It's from this room that he'll go out to watch the last sunset he'll ever see before he's forced on his path to destiny. that journey that everyone takes from innocence you know through worldliness 
and hopefully back to some kind of innocence. And that's exactly what the saga is about. And, and myths are just ways for us to get at that story. And, you know, that story mirrors an individual's progression in life. Your destiny lies along a different path from mine. The Force will be with you, always. I'm more interested in myths that sort of ring true in various different cultures rather than I am in uh, just a particular myth that may be Greek or, you know, maybe Inuit Indian or something like that. There's, I'm more interested in how these things all string together and the emotional issues that are being dealt with around, you know, around various different kinds of cultures. That's what fascinates me the most. What is it? Your father's lightsaber. This is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. Not as clumsy or random as a blaster. An elegant weapon for a more civilized age. The character of Kenobi is like a sorcerer or a sage from a more ancient legend. He's a hermit hiding in the wilderness, and this humble setting disguises his inner strengths. The simple hut, like Kenobi himself, is timeless. It would be equally at home in the Old Testament or a medieval legend as it was in a modern space fantasy. The reason these images and stories have been reiterated so often through the ages is we find that life works out that way that we have within us you know the dark side and the and the light side and the good and the evil and the devil and the, and the angel pulling at us we're all full of conflict about which way to go <laughs> These stories are now so deeply ingrained in popular culture that last year the prestigious Smithsonian Museum mounted an exhibition in their honor. But Star Wars hasn't always enjoyed such positive associations. Lucas was unhappy when the name of his film was used to describe President Reagan's space-based nuclear defense system. It's now sort of entered into the public consciousness and there are uh, references made to it in, in editorial cartoons and sitcoms. Darth Vader has become synonymous with ruthless uh, evil and so forth. The problem is, is you make a film, you do anything and people then take it, especially if you're successful. And they use it however they need to use it. And a lot of people have used it emotionally and intellectually and some people have used it commercially. Um, and it's been woven into the culture in a way that is really a part of the culture. Um, that again comes with the territory. There are certain things that when you're successful you simply have to accept as the way, the nature of the world. And there's not much you can do about it. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. The profits from Star Wars allowed Lucas to take the unusual step of financing The Empire Strikes Back and the return of the Jedi himself. When we went to do Empire, and he had already made the most successful movie of all time, uh, it gave him enormous freedom. With Empire, we knew that there would be another episode after that. There was no question that that would be possible. And so we wrote the second act of this three-act drama. And at the end of Empire, everything is unresolved. You know, all the big questions are hanging. Well, I think it's great, though, that with Star Wars, that you, you basically, you are the studio. You are the whole thing, and you control all the shots, and you don't have to deal with any inefficiency or anyone else's opinion, and it all rests on your neck. Well, And I mean, the benefits are yours, too. Yeah, well, I mean, they should be, yeah. And your friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Until Star Wars, you know, George was a kind of slave to the traditional bonds created by the people who give you the money to make your movies and then expect you to really make your movies for them, not for yourself or for audiences. And George went through that with Francis often fighting for him and 
you know, fighting off the bad guys. Lucas didn't have to look far for inspiration for his evil empire. The Jedi mind trick is that they, their mind is more powerful than other people, so they can impose upon other people their fantasy or their idea. Well, that's what being a filmmaker is like in Hollywood, because the Empire wants to hold you down and have you make crap, and uh, it's the responsibility of the filmmaker to impose his will upon the system that is resisting him. That's what happens in the Star Wars saga. And Jabba the Hutt is just like a studio head, you know. He looks like a studio head, and he, he acts like one. <laughs> For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And there's people that loathe the movie, not only for, for its content and its performances and its everything that it is. That's why they don't like it. Um, but for what it represents, which is the, in their minds ushering in a, a, a new era of merchandising driven movies. The studios are into making movies to make money, mostly, mostly. And they've always been there to make money, but there's also been a balance with just prestige. But what happened was that the other element which is to make the most amount of money for the least amount of expenditure after the phenomena of Star Wars, unbalanced it, I think. It's not, uh, it's not Lucas's doing. Um, it's uh, the type of person who uh, suddenly got control of the studios. I want to see you in a spaceship the moment the race is over. Patience, my blue friend. You'll have your winnings before the sun set, and you'll be far away from here. If anyone could do Star Wars and Jaws, then we would have had a lot of great movies since then. It's very hard to do Jaws and Star Wars. You have to be enormously talented. It's hard to be really good at anything. That's why movies, for the most part, are so bad. There just aren't that many good people around to do them. So it's not George and Steven's fault that the people who imitated them were bad. But George got an autonomy. He didn't need it. He created his own world and his own industry, in a way. And uh, one, uh, well, I must say, you know, if you want to know what's going to be the future in terms of the film industry, one goes up to San Francisco and visits George at the ranch. Although Star Wars films are often associated with Hollywood, the maverick Lucas has always chosen to base himself and his companies 400 miles north of Tinseltown. Who do you think you are? Uh, moving to San Francisco, of course, George had been raised in Modesto, so he knew San Francisco a lot better than I did, and he he liked San Francisco. I remember you were very yeah. positive. I, I, I moved here because uh, I figured after we worked on this little movie that we did on the road, that pretty much you can make films anywhere, so you might as well just pick a place exactly. that you wanted to live in and then worry about and, um, and San Francisco seemed like such a beautiful place and had a tradition of the poets and the writers and it was smaller and it was a real city. It just seemed like a very uh, a wonderful, you know, exciting adventure. We were young and just all moved up to San Francisco and, and, and try to impact this new place. Lucas's headquarters, the idyllic Skywalker Ranch, set in the rolling hills to the north of San Francisco, is the culmination of this dream. This enviable environment was made possible by the radical deal Lucas was able to secure for the Star Wars merchandising. There was a desire to ask George to take a lower fee to sort of, as it were, bet on his own movie. And uh, as, as, the as I've always understood the story, um, he said, OK, but then I want to keep the merchandising. And merchandising, which means all the toys, the clothing, the booklets, the, you know, that, that kind of thing. In fairness to the studio, merchandising was not regarded very highly in those days. Very little of it was done. It didn't earn very much money. So it was not the worst thing to say, well, if we can get him to reduce his fee by X dollars, what does it matter with the merchandising? With the success of the film, the country goes Star Wars crazy. In 
the modern world, success can't be confined to one medium. It's you know, everybody sort of thinks that the toys were thought about before the movie, but they weren't. I mean, we didn't even start doing toys until about a year after Star Wars came out. It was like way after the fact. Star Wars was, had come and gone by the time we started doing toys and things. And then it turned into a business and we sort of exploited it in order to keep the company going. Star Wars has spawned more star wares than anyone can count. It has become an inescapable phenomenon. You know, they had a shampoo that you could twist my head off and pour liquid out of my neck. And my ex-husband used to stick pins in the little doll. The little one. It's worse now. They have dolls that look like... I've always said the, the worst of my dolls look like Eddie Munster. But probably, you know, when I look at my worst, I have that quality. I think the, the scope of fandom for this film scared me a, a lot. Making a decision like being in Star Wars makes you recognizable for most of your life, I mean. It, even if I stop tomorrow, you know, for another 10, 20 years, I'll probably be very recognizable. You don't want to lose your, your life because you've chosen to do a film. I mean, I used to go in through airports and have people say, Princess Leia! Like I would then go, yes, you know, like that's my name. There's a lot of mad people around about Star Wars too. Really frighteningly strange, freaky people. I'm starting to smell them coming up every now and again now. Starting to get a bit worrying, hanging around the stage door and stuff. I mean, I don't want to upset anybody, but, you know, there's some, something a bit strange, some of them. Quite all there. May the Force be with you. People actually say that to me, for real. And I'm supposed to, I don't know what I'm meant to do. May the Force be with you, Ewan. Like, don't be ridiculous. What are you talking about? <laughs> but they do. But it is just this fanaticism that seemingly guarantees the financial success of The Phantom Menace. The budget was about 120 million. I think we brought in about 5 million under. It's about 115 million dollars. About half of that was the shooting budget, the other half was a special effects budget. Oh, hello. I am C3PO Human Cyborg Relations. How might I serve you? He's perfect. You know, it's a it's an expensive movie. The film has to be one of the top ten grossing films of all time in order to break even. So, you know, not very many films do that. They're only, you know, I say there's less than ten movies that have actually accomplished that. Uh, a lot of the movies that are being made now have to do that. I feel I got probably more of a shot than the other movies that are out there. I don't know whether it will uh, overtake Titanic. It, it, you're working in the outer limits of the stratosphere where it's really hard to measure. Uh, is it going to do one billion two or one billion one? I mean, you're talking like in hundreds of million fractions of hundreds of millions of dollars, like it was just a, you know, a thing like that. But the story doesn't end here. We're starting work on episode two now. George is actually writing the, the second episode. Uh, uh, we'll actually start shooting in 17 months. I start shooting in April of 2000. We'll start shooting in Europe. We have another uh, four or five weeks to shoot in Tunisia and four or five weeks in Italy to shoot. And then we'll move to Australia. Um, and finish mid-2000, and then the, we'll be in post-production for two years, and the film will be out basically May, middle of May of the year 2002. And somewhere around 2001, we'll start on episode three, prepping it and designing it. And then um, the process just is never ending. In the gay and lesbian holiday resort of Fire Island, and that's after Annie McBeal.